Morning, church. I'm a little bit surprised Pastor Todd was here this week. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> After last week, thought he thought he would still be in mourning, but... Uh, uh, welcome to those of you online. Paulden, that's you. Welcome to you. I uh, saw some of you in the chat just saying hi, but we're glad that you are joining uh, with us this morning and what God's got. Those of you in Baghdad, welcome to you. Um, at the, literally the end of the road, we are glad that you are with us. Um, and then uh, Jake in Iowa was somebody that's there. Jake had been around Prescott for a while. Now you're in Iowa. Welcome to you um, and anyone else that's in the online family. We're glad we get to do this together. Prescott, welcome to you. Uh, I don't know if you felt it, uh, I don't know if you caught it, but there is a, a, a journey that you've been on in worship, that, that you've been moving intentionally from, there's something good about gratitude and thankfulness, and, and when we express like, I thank God, that leads us to instantly go, well, why am I thanking God? Well, I've witnessed him here. I've witnessed him there. I've seen him do this. And, and you may be going, I don't know if I have, but I'm encouraged that you have. And so there's this, there's this building that's happening um, as, as we sing and we worship together. And when, when we truly get to thank God and we truly get to see him move and work, the only thing we have left is to go, man, I'm just, I'm just here to worship because that's the only response I've got that's, that's worth anything that you are. Uh, and, then, and then to lean into this idea that um, better is one day in the presence of Jesus than thousands anywhere else, right? Because when we catch the, what he's done and we catch that, man, I'm just, I'm just here to make much of you, then all of a sudden it's like to spend time in his presence. That eternity is going to be that we will be in the presence of God that we will enjoy what he always intended for us, that there will be this deep relationship without all the brokenness, without all the pain, without all the suffering. All of a sudden, it's like, that's, that's where I'm, re I'm ready. That's where I want to be. But it also ties back to life, right? That, that I, I don't know how you feel, but I really want and I really care that what we think about Jesus and what we think about our faith matters on Tuesday at 4.30, as much as it does right here. I really hope that, and why Tuesday at 4.30? Because for me, Tuesdays are long days. And by the time I get to 4.30 in the afternoon, I'm a little grumpy. Uh, I don't know how you, you are at 4.30 on a Tuesday. But, but Tuesday, Tuesday at 4.30, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm a little bit spent. And I want Jesus to be real in those moments of my life. I don't know about you, but I, I got kiddos. Um, and my 10-year-old, my uh, true story, I'm tucking her in bed the other night. And she goes, she got water next to her bed. And she, she goes, can, can you get me some water? And I'm like, you got water. And, and she's like, no, can you get me fresh water? <laughs> she's like, that's old. <laughs> First world problems, right? But I want it to matter. I want my faith to matter at that time of night, tucking her into bed when I'm spent and I'm going to serve by going downstairs and getting fresh water because the water's a little old, right? Which I don't know how you do in those moments, but I was like, girl, you don't know. There's people on this planet that don't have any water. They got to walk to get there, you know, like that whole speech that parents so often help us out with. Uh, but, but, I don't know about you, but if you're new here, the best welcome I can give you is welcome to a space where hopefully what happens in here and what we learn about God and what we grow in about God matters at 4.30 on a Tuesday. Like welcome to a group of people that I, as I look around the room, right? And as I see names online, like, like I know, I know sitting in Paulden today, there are people that it matters to them at night when they're spent that Jesus still is impacting those moments. I look around this room and I see those of you that walk this out in every space of life. And so if you're new to any of our spaces, whether that be Baghdad, Paulden here online, I just need you to know we're all pursuing this thing that Jesus is real and he impacts everything we do. And that's where we're heading. That's what this series or this collection of talks that we're heading into is all about. That we're rallying around this thought that there is a center of it all. 
that everything in life, everything in the universe, everything boils down to a center point. If you think about it this way, think of a vinyl record, right? Could you imagine if the hole in the vinyl record wasn't centered? Right? Imagine what happens as that thing clunks around, right? It's not long before you're damaging everything and, and it's destroyed and not good. If we get the center wrong, we get life wrong. And this collection of talks as we lean in is leaning into the idea that there is a center point and it is Jesus and Jesus only is the center point. Then in all of life, in everything we do, in everything we talk about, Jesus is the hero. Jesus is the big deal. Jesus is the one that our lives revolve around, not the other way around. That Jesus is the center. And I, I don't know what, what you feel or what that does for you, but when it comes to what we're going to do with the Bible is we're going to take a walk through the Bible over the next weeks together. It'll lead us probably beyond Easter. But looking at the Bible and going, you realize that the Bible and the way the Bible's written and the way that it was created and given to us by God, that the Bible declares that from start to finish, it's all about Jesus. It's all pointing forward to him or it's all pointing to him when he was here or it's pointing to a future with him. But all of it is about defining who is Jesus all the way through, we're going to look at through the Old Testament, these moments that point to the person of Jesus together. It's interesting. If you, if you think about how often you meet Jesus, it often starts in our, our cultural context with what? Here's Jesus and why you need him. You know, it's interesting. If, if you go outside of our cultural context, um, a number of years ago, my wife and I were missionaries. And part of what we did with the mission organization is we train missionaries to go into remote areas on the planet. And by remote, I mean this group of people may not have ever seen anyone from the outside. It's only been their indigenous group, and that's it. So they've got no written language, no culture, no Bible. And a missionary decides that they're called by God, and they step into that space. And when the missionary gets there, here's what's interesting. They don't get there and begin to talk about Jesus. Why? Because they don't have the language to talk about Jesus. And so there's many years of just learning language and culture to be able to translate the Bible, to be able to even talk about Jesus in a way that makes sense. But what they discovered along the way is that you have to displace and replace the theology of these indigenous groups. And by what that means is that you have to go in and take all of their understanding of who they think God is, right? Because a lot of times in these groups, it's animistic. And so what you get is they have all these different gods that control everything in their life. So an example would be if you want it to rain, you better do the right thing to the God of rain so that it rains on that day. And so the missionary is watching this, right? And, and as, as this is happening... They do their, their rain incantation, whatever it happens to be, whether it's a dance or just some procedure. And the missionary notices it didn't rain. And the missionary comes along the same day and looks up and goes, huh, didn't rain today. And all it's doing is making people question, what do I believe? Why didn't that God show up? But when it comes to presenting the story of God to them, the, the love story we've been left with, they realize that if we just show up and talk about Jesus, they take Jesus and put it into all these other gods. And now this Jesus is just for this thing. And so what they started doing is they realized we have to go back to the beginning and we have to walk through the story piece by piece to get to Jesus. And along the way, displace what they think and replace it with what the Bible says. And what's amazing is this, that as they would go and they would spend weeks walking through the Old Testament, right? They'd introduce the person of Jesus in, in his birth, like Jesus, is God in human form. And, and, and they're going, oh, this is the hero of the story. And they walk through Jesus's life. And then it comes to the crucifixion and they lay out the crucifixion in a, and they try and do a, their best job because they don't have screens and everything else that we have. They do their best job to put on a play to show them what it's like. 
But you know the response of these indigenous groups when they get to the death and burial of Jesus? They break into mourning. They begin to wail. They become extremely sad. Why? Because the hero of the story just died. The hero that they've been looking at all the way through scripture going, he's coming, he's coming, he's here. Salvation's coming. And then all of a sudden, what happens? He dies. And and the missionaries leave it for three days. And these groups often go into a time and, and mourn in the way that makes sense to them. And then you know what happens on day three? They gather again. And the missionary begins to tell them about this God who raised from the dead, this Jesus who is alive. And you know what erupts? Absolute celebration. Why? Because the hero of the story conquered death. They understand what's been coming. They understand that this moment is now the the monumental moment, the crowning moment of the story is that Jesus is raised from the dead and we have life. And so celebration breaks out and the party continues in most places for days because this Jesus, how could it be this good? Just in hearing that, do you ever feel like, ah, I miss that. You ever feel like, oh, that's, how did I miss all those connection points? You ever feel like in the Old Testament, what was really happening? You ever, you ever feel like you just misunderstood the book? And, and so we're going to take some time and we're going we're gonna to go through and we're going to look at how all of this has always been pointing to Jesus because he's the hero of the story. Now you, some, for some of you... Um, you may wonder, like, what, what are the values of the church, John? Our number one value is a church because we, we believe this, this Jesus is the hero. The value that holds us true north and what we create and why we do it and how we do it. The first value is that we are for Jesus as a church. What, what that means is everything we create is that Jesus is the big deal. We are not. Jesus is the main um, storyline, if you like. And some of you are probably like, Duh. That's a little obvious. You know what's interesting, though? You would expect that of a church, right? You would expect that we, we have Jesus as the main thing. But why is it often we expect it of the church, but we don't expect it of our own lives? It's just a fascinating dichotomy that we create where, where we expect it of one thing, but not of another. And so hopefully as we journey through this collection of talks together, what happens is we build together that Jesus is what this is all about. And Colossians captures this really well. In Colossians chapter one, verse 15, it says the son, which would be Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Jesus... All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through Jesus and for Jesus. Jesus is before all things and in Jesus, all things hold together. And Jesus is the head of the body, the church, He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything Jesus might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus and through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether all things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through Jesus's blood shed on the cross. Jesus is the center. Right, well, well, what Paul's declaring here to the church in Colossae, because there's a lot of people questioning who Jesus was. There was, there was people coming against the church going, well, he wasn't really God. And so what Paul's doing right as clear as he can, he's going, no, 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 listen, Jesus, Jesus is not only the center, he is supreme overall. There is nothing higher or greater than the person of Jesus. And then he brings it down to, to, to the very nature, the street, if you like. He brings it down to the, to the walking of our lives where he goes, and Jesus, everything was made by Jesus 
and for Jesus. And what that means is this, that, that everything you see, everything you don't see, the, creative, the creating agent within creation itself, so God, three in one, Father, Son, Spirit, the Trinity, out of the Trinity, the creating agent was Jesus himself, that everything has been made by Jesus. That there is nothing that you see, nothing you experience that Jesus did not put into motion. And for some of you, you're going, okay, hang on. My theology is getting messed with a little bit, right? Because I thought it was God that created. Well, Jesus is God. That's what Paul's establishing. And in this, Jesus now, the creating agent for the Trinity, has put all things in motion. And that's great when we think about everything, like everything. And we have this broad macro level, right? But if we bring it down to us, this is how it changes. Rhonda, can I pick on you for a second? Are you okay with that? Um, you're amazing, by the way. But this is how it works, right? Because we can read a passage like this and go, well, Jesus, Jesus, everything was created by Jesus. Rhonda, you were created by Jesus. See what happens? It goes from this giant, big conversation to, wait, Rhonda was created by Jesus. You were created by Jesus. Do you know what question you just answered? Who am I? Who are you? You're one that's created intimately by who? The person of Jesus. So you've answered one macro level. You might have thought, well, I've just come to church today. You just answered one massive question about who you are. Who are you? You are one that has been created by Jesus. And then he answers the second question. Rhonda, you were created for Jesus. You just answered for Rhonda the purpose of life. What is the purpose of life? Well, we know who we are. We're created by Jesus. What is the purpose of all this? That you were created for Jesus. Your entire life, the purpose of your life, the reason you exist is you were created for him. What does that mean? That means that on a Tuesday at 4.30 when you're grumpy, right? Like in that moment, that's for Jesus, right? What does that look like? Well, inside, inside of you, inside of humanity, we have been given the ability. You know, when you showed up to worship today, the ability you were given is to make much of God. You were able to say, he's what matters. And by raising my hands away from myself and towards the heavens, I am designating that it is not about me. It is not for me. It is for him that I exist. Right? And we get that in the church setting. We get that in here. We're like, oh yeah, raise your hands. And then we leave here and we live all the other hours of our life for me. And then we come back on the weekend and go, hey, it's for him. Right? And yet the reality is that every single moment, including the fresh water moment, is for him. You're living it for him. You're putting him on display. You're taking him everywhere you go. Why? Because the story is about Jesus, not about me, not about you. I'll be honest with you, if you're sitting here and you're uh, human like the rest of us, or maybe you're sitting on a nice couch with breakfast, we don't like that. We don't like it. I don't like this verse. That my existence, the answer to the question of the purpose of why are we on planet earth is for him. I don't like that. But, but this was always meant to be. And this is the part we miss because we read this moment and we think, oh, God's up to something new in Jesus. No, he's always been up to this. He's always desired this. Salvation has just allowed us to orient our life to go, no, it's about him, not me. It's given us the power through the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. Here's what I mean. If you go back to Genesis, Genesis is the very first book of the Bible, if you're not familiar with the Bible. And we're going to go in the very first chapter. So, so like the, the, 
one, one, right? Like it's the beginning of the beginnings. Verse 26 says this, then God said, let us, there's that Trinity, right? All three of them connected. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. There's the Trinity again, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God, so God, so we know from the verses we read, right? That Jesus, the creative agent, created mankind in his own image. So, so in the image of God, right? Why is it important to catch this? Because when Jesus was on earth and all of the presence, as Colossians talks about, was packed into Jesus. So all the presence of God was packed into Jesus. This is why when Jesus is walking around and people are like, show us the father, what do they do? They look at him and go, you've seen him. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. It's the same concept here that God packed into mankind his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So, so what it's getting at is inside of humanity, inside of each one of us, what has been packed into us is the presence, presence and essence of who God is. You are an image bearer. That's the way that it was intended for humanity from the very start. And so what we get here is we get a connection to what God is doing on this side. When we talk about meeting Jesus, what he's actually, what is actually happening is he's restoring back to what? That the image that you carry can now bear for him instead of for yourself. This is a massive moment that you are an image bearer. What does that mean? That, that just like when you look at Jesus and you see the Father, just like when you see the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's like, hey, let me tell you about what Jesus is like. Let me guide you into all the things that Jesus said and who he was. Just like when you see the Holy Spirit, just like when you see the Father, what are they doing? They're pointing to Jesus. And what is Jesus pointing to? The others. What is the purpose of you being for him is that your life, your life would be a billboard to the person of Jesus. Then on a 430 on a Tuesday, you would look at me and what you would actually see is Jesus. Right? That, that, that's what we've been packed with is this image bearer is that I get to put God on display. You get to put God on display everywhere you go. That there's not one moment that you're not an image bearer. You don't get to put it down because you're having a bad moment, right? But even in the midst of the bad moments, I'm reminded that I'm an image bearer. That there's a higher calling to my life. And it's packed right here in Genesis chapter one. The story moves along, right? And, and these first humans, they, they decide, just like we have to, am I going to be for me or for him? And so they have a decision to make in this moment. It's, 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 am I going to be orient my life from what I'm doing and my choices around me, or am I going to orient it around God? And they choose to orient it around me. They choose for me. And out of choosing for me, there's consequences to those actions. It's their broken relationship with God. Sin enters, right? Which just starts to destroy everything including the way that they view themselves. How do we know that? Because as the story continues, they discover they're naked and their nakedness brings shame. And so because they're so shameful and guilty, they decide that they're gonna try and come up with some leaves to cover up. And they end up hiding behind, behind something because they hear God coming. They're hiding in the garden, right? And this is what I want you to catch about God. Because as they're hiding in their shame and their guilt, what does God do? Hey, where are you? I don't know what you expect. But the God of creation, I, like the way he's portrayed and painted, that this God could show up with a great big baseball bat, right? And that would be fitting. That he should discipline them. That would be fitting. That he should just leave them alone. Don't talk to them. Ignore them. Abandon them. That he should leave them to their own destruction. And yet what you get in the midst of the story is God showing up and going, where are you? Which is a point forward in the story. That what God wants from you, what God is longing for from you, 
is relationship with him above everything else. You know what carries into 430? Not some truths that I know intellectually, but a relationship with God that's intimate. That's what shows up on a Tuesday at 430. You know what carries into the hard moments where I got really difficult choices of for me or for him? It, it's the relationship with God that carries into those moments that allows me to remind myself of my purpose and who he is. And in the garden, what we find in this, this first story, what we find is, is that what we're given is this God who is relational, who is gonna come alongside you in your worst moments of shame and guilt. And what I love is that, that, that at the, as the story unfolds, in verse 21, it says, the Lord God, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. I bet you didn't have this on your characteristics of God, that he is a clothing designer. Can you, can you imagine walking around like, oh, you're wearing them? This is God, right? <laughs> that fits pretty tight. Uh, well, what's amazing is we could gloss over this verse so quickly that, oh, God made him close. But don't miss what's happening because there is a much larger picture that's being created. There's this phrase, substitutionary atonement, right? There's your $10 phrase for the day. But what, what's being set in motion here is substitutionary atonement. The idea that a substitute would step forward and pay what's required to cover shame and guilt. That God takes an animal and what's set in motion is you can't get the skin off the animal without killing the animal. That something has to die. There's sacrifice involved. Something has to die. Why? That this animal would pay the price so that the skin could be taken. Why? So that God could design clothes and put them on the first humans. Why? So that through this substitute, through this sacrifice, they would be covered in their shame, in their guilt. So they don't have to hide from God. Hi, anybody else going, man, that sounds a whole lot like something else later in the story. That all the way in chapter three of the book, God's already setting up that it's through substitutionary atonement that we will be rescued. That your shame and your guilt and your sin and your brokenness, that it will be paid for through sacrifice. It's set up way back here and it's pointing where? To the hero of the story, Jesus, who is to come. And it's in a verse that you might just skip right by in your Bible reading plan. But all of it points forward to Jesus. There's, there's one other because it carries on. They have kids, right? Adam and Eve have kids outside of the garden. It's symbolic that it's outside of the garden because it's a way, it's a way from where God had them. And the first two humans on the, that are born after Adam and Eve, it says this about them. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions and some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So these two brothers, right? Very different. I don't know if you got brothers, but brothers are very different. One's a farmer. One's raising livestock. And both of them decide that that word offering is a gift, right? They're going to give a gift to God. 
one of them decides that he is going to bring the, the fat portions. And the fat portions were the best part. And it's out of his firstborn. So it's, so it's the, the first that he has, he's going to take the best and give it to God. There's a lesson there for another day. But the other brother, he decides, you know what? I'll give God some of my fruits. And what happens is that it's not the first of his fruits. It's just some. It's not the best. And we don't understand what God had told him ahead of time. We don't have that privilege. We just have the results after. And what's really interesting is there's a word in here that it says God had favor towards Abel. You know what, you know what the word favor is in the Bible all the way through is grace. The grace was abundant. And Cain... God does not look with favor, with grace on what he did. And here's what's stunning, is you have two brothers bringing gifts. One of them is accepted, one of them is not. That is not politically correct in 2024. That is not fair. Shouldn't they get participation medals? But it's setting something in motion that's so important that goes against our culture that goes against everything that's wired from the world around us. And it's this, that God has a specific way he intends for you to approach him. And he always has. And what's amazing is you get to Hebrews later in the story and it's talking about Cain and Abel. And it says that Abel came by faith. You know what's stunning in the fourth chapter of the book, God is setting up that if you want to approach a holy God, if you want to step into relationship with Jesus, it is only gonna be by faith that you receive grace. And it's in the fourth chapter that God's setting in motion that you can't just roll up however you want. You can't just step up to God and go, well, look how good I am. Because God's gonna look at you and go, that's not what I asked you to bring. What I asked you to bring is faith. Faith that you would trust me. Now, there's an interesting word, trust, right? What is God looking from you today? Trust. Trust in what? Well, Jesus, you are the center of the story. And if you are the center of the story, then that means I'm not. Trust that Jesus the only way to you is by grace because that's how God set it up. And right here, God's going, hey, if you, if you do what is acceptable, would I not, or if you do what I've told you is right, would, it, would I not accept you? People get so mad at God, right? Well, that's not fair. That's not fair that it's by Jesus. Well, you're not God. And we have to trust that he knows what he's doing. Because culture around us will tell us, well, God's unfair. Well, that's your opinion. I think if you're God, you're allowed to set the rules to the game. I think if you're the creator, then you're also the owner. And I have to think if you're the owner, you can do whatever you want with what your creation is. And here's what's beautiful about God. He doesn't force it, right? He goes, hey, are you going to trust me? But that's going to require that you submit. Oh, there's another word we do not like. But will you come under the way that God has told you to come? It's trusting and submitting, trusting and submitting, trusting and submitting. Because here's what happens when I trust, when I trust God, and I trust what God's telling me, right? I mean, we're only four chapters into the book and God's been laying, laying a plan that there'll, there'll, there'll be substitution, that Jesus later is the substitute. The, 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 the way that, that, that there's gotta be sacrifice, well, Jesus comes to die as a sacrifice, right? When I start to trust that, then I can start to trust that, wait, if that's the case and I can't save myself, then, then I need to submit to God in your way. 
And here's what's amazing. When I do that, all of a sudden I realize, God, this world is not about me and you are worthy of everything I've got. You're worthy of it all. There's nothing that you don't deserve from me. You can have my Sunday morning when I look my best and you can have my Thursday night when I'm grumbling on my way down the stairs to replace old water. You're worthy of every piece of it. But it requires that I just simply go, man, I'm gonna trust and I'm gonna submit. And so we're gonna, we're gonna worship together and I wanna invite you to stand and I wanna do something that's a gift over you today, if, if you'll let me. Um, if you're new to church, we don't always do this. But if you're willing, I would love for you to just hold out your hands in front of you. And I just want to leave you with a blessing of who Jesus is. Just receive it. But it's the verses in Colossians. That Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. For in Jesus, all things were created things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Jesus is before all things and in Jesus, all things hold together. And Jesus is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might, he might, Jesus might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus and through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through Jesus' blood shed on the cross.